Happy Sabbath, church. Today's scripture reading will be from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether, we, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. As Brother Gene shared with you earlier, Ellen White passed away a hundred years ago this coming Thursday, July the 16th, at 87 years of age. During her life, she played a major role in the establishment of our church. She fulfilled many duties associated with that. As many of you know, she allowed God to use her when a couple guys named Foss and Foy declined to do what God asked them to do. If you look at the entirety of her life, I think she is proudest of the role of just being a disciple of Jesus. If she could wish anything for each of us, I think her wish would be, we would be disciples of Jesus. Now, being a disciple of Jesus is significantly different than being a Christian. Significantly different than having your name on a membership role of any church. So for the next few minutes, we're going to consider the cost of being a disciple. It's in Luke 14. You might want to turn there. We will review a couple of the verses Nathan shared. Luke 14. And I want you to first notice that this Section Luke 14, 25 through 35 comes right after a parable that's called the parable of the Great Supper. Now, for the sake of time, let me share with you that that parable espouses that the excuses of those who wouldn't come to the meal indicated that those who should have come to the meal were preoccupied with things other than God. Then Jesus goes into these four principles of what it means to, in fact, be a disciple of God. Now, I happen to believe that nothing in the Bible is by happenstance. I think the Holy Spirit does exactly what the Holy Spirit needs to be done. And I think the proximity of the parable of the Lord's Supper, the Great Supper, sorry, and the principles of discipleship are right next to each other because God is a pretty good teacher. And good teachers always give you a non-example and an example. So there's no confusion on the lesson the teacher is trying to teach. 
So Luke 14, 25, a great multitude went with Jesus and he turned and said to them, a great crowd is following Jesus, but very few of them are disciples. I think that's also pretty true of the Christian church today. There are lots of us who claim to be following Jesus, but not his way, our own way. These people in Luke 14, 25 had a preconceived notion that Jesus was soon going to proclaim himself to be the king of their nation and throw the Romans out. That's why they were following him. They wanted to see this great event that they all hoped and longed for. A man by the name of John Lubbock, who's a British statesman of the 1800s, explained what's going on in the mind of the multitude back then, and I suggest in the multitude today. What we see depends mainly on what we look for. The multitude back then was looking for someone to kick the Romans out. And that's what they saw in Jesus. Regardless of all the teachings of the Old Testament, all the teachings of Jesus during his earthly ministry... They chose to see what they wanted to see. And most of them were not disciples. But I think most of us want to be disciples. So let's take a look at this passage in Luke chapter 14. And we're going to see four principles that Jesus teaches. Principles, if you don't know, are universally true statements that are, exist across time and across culture. So the principles that Jesus taught 2,000 years ago still are applicable for us today. Listen to this quote from Ellen White, fourth volume of the Testimonies, page 562, and you'll understand the significance of principles. It should be the first work of all connected with God's church to be right before God themselves. And then to stand in the strength of Christ, unaffected by the wrong influences to which they will be exposed, especially in our century. If we make the broad principles of the word of God the foundation of our character, we may stand wherever the Lord and his providence may call us, surrounded by any detrimental influence and yet not be swayed from the path of right. By understanding principles, applying them to our lives, we will be the children God has called us to be. So the first principle that we can glean from this passage today is discipleship involves cross-bearing. This weeds out lots of people right to begin with. Verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone who comes to me and does not hate his family, they cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now that's an awfully interesting word. Cannot be my disciple. Verse 26 is a hyperbole. Jesus is exaggerating to prove a point. But I want you to think about the difference between will not be my disciple which he could have said, and cannot be my disciple. One is talking about the probability of something happening. It will, it won't, it might rain, it might not. The second is talking about capability. If you don't carry your cross, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus. Now, for us, that may not carry a lot of meaning, but in the first century, those people to whom Jesus is speaking remember the crosses that the Romans used to take care of all the people who revolted against them just years before. This is a vivid, painful memory. And Jesus says, you're going to do the same thing or you're not on my team. Cross 
cross-bearing. Keep your finger in Luke, but go over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, land in verse 38. Jesus is speaking again and says, And he who does not take up, and he who does not take his cross and follow me after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. If you put these two passages that we've looked at together, you come to the conclusion no human obligation is an acceptable excuse for not taking up the cross of loyalty, of obedience, and of service to Jesus. Either God is first or he isn't. Either you are a disciple or you're just a member of the crowd. Think about the congregation in Charleston a few weeks ago, nine of which were murdered. You guys do know that the guy who killed the nine church members sat with them for an hour studying the Bible before he killed them? Those people were being obedient disciples. They didn't know what was about to happen, but the next week that congregation knew what happened and they chose to have worship anyway. No greater honor can come to us as God's children than to carry our cross. Desire of Ages, page 224. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose for which they are fulfilling. Early 1990s, I had my whole life figured out. I knew where I was going. I knew where I'd been. I knew the next step I had to take. And God goes, no, that's not what I have planned. And he started closing doors, and I was mad. I mean, I had worked 15 years to get to the right point in my career. And he started closing doors, and you've got to be kidding me. What's up with this? Now, after being a pastor for 15 years, it's making a little bit more sense. Now, granted, I wish I'd have had that sense 15 years ago, but that's not how God operates. Discipleship involves cross-bearing. You all have a cross or two. If you're going to be a disciple, pick it up and do what God asks. Second principle Cost of being a disciple should be considered, verses 28 through 32. In that four verses, Jesus warns about lightly assuming the responsibility of being a disciple. Don't begin something unless you think you can finish it. Quite honestly, I think that's exactly what Foss and Foy was, were doing when they said, No thanks, Lord, I don't want to be your spokesperson. Cost is an interesting concept. Cost means the complete, permanent abandonment of your personal ambitions. I have to give up an Air Force career that I'd worked for 24 years at that point to achieve just to be a disciple? Yeah, that's what it costs. Ellen White was an example of putting personal ambition, desires, dreams, and wants aside and doing what the Lord asked. Compare her life with the rich young ruler of Luke 18. Luke 18, this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Hey! I want to be on your team. What do I have to do? Jesus says, keep all the commandments. I'm doing those. I got that under control. What else? And Jesus says, go sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and come after me. 
Ooh. Ooh. I'm not too sure I want to do that. Luke 18, verse 22. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to them, you will still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Come and follow me. But when he, the rich young ruler, heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. I'll do 80% of what you ask. But not that. You see, to be a disciple, you got to do that one thing that you don't want to do. Amen. The rich young ruler cherished his possessions more than he wanted to follow God. Some of us are like that too. Amen. Third principle from our passage in Luke 14 must lay all personal ambition and possessions on the altar of sacrifice. 14.33, Jesus says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot, there's that word again, be my disciple. Notice he doesn't say most of what you have. Notice he doesn't say the majority of what you have. He says all. Of what you have. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 31 says he chose to die daily so he could be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Christianity is about martyrdom, not simply spiritual bliss and ethical uprightness. It is an active, participatory relationship. You got to get in the game and give up everything you have for the team. I grew up a non Adventist. I grew up a non Christian. I spent a lot of my youth playing team sports. And I wish everybody had that opportunity because I, it teaches you this principle. I may have told you, when I was a senior year in high school, I was on the state soccer championship team. We lost, I think, two games out of 18 that season. We won the championship. Eleven guys putting the team before self. That's what it takes to be a champion. Women's World Cup soccer championship. We just watched that last week. I guarantee you that anyone and everyone on that team put the team before self. Wambach, her third World Cup, probably the best known women's soccer player in the world, didn't play in the second half of the tournament because she wasn't the best player. And she was thrilled to sit on the bench. Because the team was going to win. Stewardship is the term we use to talk about managing the things God gives us. Sometimes we focus too much on money. We really do. I think we do. Stewardship involves not only the tithe, also your time. Disciples don't come to church from 9 till 1 on Sabbath and forget it the rest of the week. They're disciples all the time. How about your temple? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit? How about your testimony? Uh, where's Bill? Is Bill still with us? I lost Bill. He might be downstairs. In his lesson today, he said his testimony was when he took his wife to that really nice restaurant, Waffle House. <laughs> I like that line. I had to fit it in. <laughs> they prayed over the meal. Their testimony. And how about your talents? Do you give all the skills you have to God? Must lay all ambition and possessions on the altar of sacrifice. The fourth principle from this passage is the spirit of sacrifice must be maintained permanently. 
you got to be kidding me. Not only do I have to give up everything, but I always have to be giving up everything. We're in the salt portion of the story, verses 34 and 35. Underlying premise of the illustration of salt is preservation. That's what it did back then. Jesus is teaching his disciples then and his disciples now that they must recognize their task is to help preserve those sinners who don't know Jesus. Because if not, you're just ready to be thrown on the heap of dung that's over there somewhere. Four principles of being a disciple. None of them are easy. None of them can we do in our own strength. But if we're going to be a disciple, you got to do all four. All the time. That's why there's lots of people in the crowd, but only a few disciples. In closing, turn your bulletin to the back. Look at the thought of the day. The second paragraph of that quote, There is a heaven before us, a crown of life to win, but to the overcomer only is the reward given. He who gains heaven must be clothed with a robe of righteousness. Every man that has his hope in him, Jesus, purifies themselves even as he, Jesus, is pure. In the character of Christ there is no discord of any kind, and this must be our experience. Our lives must be controlled by the principles that controlled his life. And if you don't know all the principles, start with the four that Dr. Luke shared with us in chapter 14. We're going to break for the ordinance of humility. Then we're going to come back and we're going to enjoy the Lord's Supper together. And at the end of the Lord's Supper, we're collecting a love offering. I'm going to remember that this time. If you choose to remain in this room and not go to foot washing, that's certainly acceptable. But talking in this room is not. If you sit here, you sit here quietly and without your electronic babysitter. Because I want you to be thinking about the principles that govern the lives of disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's split it this time.